Welcome to the fifth National VTS, National GP Trainee Teaching Session. Um, for those that are joining for the first time, welcome. I'll just do a brief introduction. For those that have come to many of the others before, welcome back. So my name is uh, Dr. Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP based here in Birmingham and Solihull. I'm the medical director of eMedica and I have a, a number of different clinical roles. So I'm a partner in my own practice. I'm a resident GP in a secure unit for women with significant mental health. I work in detox in the community um, and then my main role is in medical education. So, you know, I teach anywhere from medical students to mostly people that are involved in GP training, either getting into GP training or doing membership exams or GP careers afterwards. Okay. In terms of AKT, we're going to do a couple of clinical questions, a stats question and an admin question. Uh, then we're going to look at some key consultation skills. And I'm going to start trying to look at a different skill each session but use that skill in a case to sort of make it come alive, hopefully, and see how you could practically use it in real life. And then in terms of ePortfolio today, we're gonna to look at clinical case reviews, okay? And at the end, a chance to ask any questions you'd like. So in terms of AKT, we're gonna do four high yield questions. We'll do two clinical, one admin, one stats. You'll have about 57 seconds for uh, looking at the question, and then I'll launch the poll, okay? okay so here we go. First question is gonna be clinical. The most popular answer, about 60% of you picked B, that is stage one. Um, and then after that, really split evenly between unlikely to have COPD and have stage two COPD. They were both about 20% each. And then the others, very few people. Okay. So the correct answer here is B. This patient has stage one COPD. So well done. 60% of you got that right. Okay. That, that's you know, very good. But the 40% that didn't, let's look at why. So the first thing is, is FEV1 FVC ratio is 0.65, so that's less than 0.7. So that gives an obstructive picture. To make a diagnosis of COPD, that's one of the things we look for. The other things are to do with symptoms, okay? Um, and he's got some of the core symptoms. So you can see he's got chronic cough, increased shortness of breath, and he's got some wheeze. And he gets short of breath when he's hurrying or walking up a slight hill. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then his FEV1 is 85% of expected. now couple of things. Some of you that picked that he's unlikely to have COPD, it might be because you saw this. This is normal, actually. Okay. But if you've got typical symptoms alongside risk factors, so he's got um, 30 pack year smoking history, that's a significant risk factor. Um, and then uh, as well as that, you've got an obstructive picture on spirometry. So FEV1 FVC is less than 0.7. Then even with a normal FEV1, you diagnose stage one or mild COPD. Okay, so that's why it's B. Now, what are the core symptoms? So he had some of the core symptoms of COPD. Just type into the chat, I'll reopen that. What are some of the other core symptoms of COPD that would make you first, in the first place, think about sending someone for spirometry? And alongside those core symptoms, feel free to also write what are the risk factors? So he had one, smoking for a long time, 30 pack year history of smoking. What are some of the other risk factors and what are the, some of the other core symptoms? Okay, so breathlessness he had, yeah, wheezy had, so someone said phlegm. So yeah, being very productive, okay, of sputum, great. Uh, exposure to asbestos, so maybe in the environment, yes, great. Um, someone's mentioned alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency. Someone's mentioned passive smoking, recurrent uh, bronchitis. Chronic cough he had uh, as a risk factor. Someone's mentioned obesity. Um, great. So you've got a lot of the, the key things we're looking for. So if we look at the sort of how to make a diagnosis, first thing is to look at the history in terms of risk factors. So smoking is one of the biggest ones. If someone is not a smoker, then 
almost certainly they will have either through their occupation or the environment they're going to have exposure so you know occupations people that were builders that worked with asbestos miners okay um, you know environment very dusty that kind of environment okay um, uh, you know things that would also increase your risk of things like lung cancer and mesothelioma and then you've got to have at least one or more of the core symptoms so shortness of breath chronic recurrent cough regular sputum production getting frequent lower respiratory tract infections um, and then wheeze okay um, so you've got to have um, at least one of those core symptoms although you can't diagnose it and then in terms of spirometry you're looking for an fev1 FVC ratio of less than 0.7. Sometimes that's described as 70% because that ratio, if you turned it into a percentage, is 70%. That gives you an obstructive picture. If it's more than that, that's a restrictive picture. Okay. And then once you've got that obstructive picture and they've got core symptoms, that's when you now look at the FE1 as a percentage of expected. And it's percentage of expected of we look at age and height. Okay. So 80% or more is actually normal. But with the rest of it, the fact that he had risk factors, he's got core symptoms, and he's got an obstructive picture, then we still diagnose that in the new guidelines as stage one mild. In the old guidelines, actually, this person wouldn't be diagnosed as having COPD. Stage two or moderate COPD is where it's the FEV1 as a percentage of expected is between 50 and 79. Once it drops under 50%, but at least 30, that's stage three or very severe. And then less than 30% is stage four which is very severe, okay. So a couple of people have said they're having issues with audio. Uh, can I just check, is audio clear for most of you? Um, I, I'm not getting any indicator that the audio is a problem here. So um, it may well be, try logging in, logging out, logging, or try uh, plugging in the headphones. It might be if you've got uh, speakers and a headphone or something like that, but everyone else can hear? Okay, good, okay, good. So right, I'm gonna show you now, we could have had that same scenario and been asked a slightly different question. So have a look at this question, okay? Uh, same scenario, but imagine now instead of asking what the diagnosis is, we ask you to identify something from the history. So have a look at this question. Right, so this time, not as clear cut. Again, the most popular answer is B, but then about a third of you have picked A and just under 20% have picked C. So A, B, C are the really, really popular ones, okay? So this is grade two, and that's because you often get short of breath when hurrying or walking up a slight hill. Why is that important? Because if someone's grade one, that's basically normal. You can leave them with what they're on so for example this person's just been diagnosed um you know if they're grade one they might not need any treatment okay but generally we'd start them on something like salbutamol or atrovent as a prn and then if they're having to use it a lot and they're grade two or more that's when you start thinking about starting them on some kind of long-term medication and then again if they're grade two or more when we review them we might go up a step okay so let's look at the MRC scale. The MRC scale is really, really, it stands for Medical Research Council scale uh, for assessing dyspnea. And what it does is it gives a functional grading, i.e. it describes, regardless of the disease, the degree of breathlessness related to activity caused by that. So you could use it, for example, to look at how symptomatic someone is who's got asthma, who's got COPD, who's got heart failure, who's got significant angina, okay? So grade one is normal. No breathlessness except under strenuous exercise. I, you don't get out of breath unless like you've gone for a really hard run for half an hour. You've ridden a bike for an hour. It's normal to get out of breath if you do strenuous exercise, isn't it? Okay. Grade two is you get short of breath hurrying on a flat surface or walking up a slight hill, not running. 
Now, do you see, that's not normal. I know a lot of us in this audience today are grade two as we sit here now. That's because we're not fit. We've not been doing enough exercise and we've put on some COVID weight, okay? It can't be just me, all right? But you can see grade two is not normal. We shouldn't get short of breath if you're hurrying on a flat. You shouldn't get short of breath if you're walking up a slight hill, okay? Grade three is people who, compared to other people who are just walking, they're a lot slower, even on level ground. They have to stop for breath while they're walking at their own pace. So even though they're going slower than everyone else, they still have to stop every so often for breath. Grade four is they can't go more than about 100 meters before they have to stop for a good few minutes on a flat you know, level ground. And grade five, these are the patients that end up often on home oxygen. They're too breathless to leave the house. They get breathless when they're either getting dressed or getting undressed. They can't finish doing that in its entirety without having to stop to catch their puff, okay? So grade two or more, generally, we start thinking about adding in more treatment, okay? All right, let's move on to an admin question. Okay, so again, the admin domain is the one that doctors do worst in, in the real AKT, okay? So um, you know, don't worry if you find this stuff difficult. Um, that's one of the reasons that you know, you're here, right? We're gonna cover it. So we can see that every answer has been picked. The most popular two are A and C, D2 and D4, okay? So this is someone who uh, wants to become a lorry driver and now they need to have a physical examination and a medical report by a qualified doctor. So which is the likely form for us to complete for this patient? The correct answer is C, D4. So about just under 40% of you got it right. So I, more of you got this wrong than got it right, okay? So let's go through the forms and I'll come back to this in a question uh, in, in a minute. So the different forms that were mentioned there, D4 is a medical report for a group two driver license. So a, a group two driver is someone who drives like a lorry or a bus or a coach, okay? Um, so when you apply for a group two license first, you have to have a medical report filled in by a fully qualified doctor. It could be your own GP, but there are some private companies that that's all they do. They just do medicals for like lorry drivers and uh, bus drivers and so on. Um, so there's like a report and then an examination, okay? A test of your vision and things like that. And just to make sure you don't have any of the illnesses that would make driving unsafe. Um, and there's a fee payable for that because that's not covered under the NHS. So the form is called a D4, okay? Uh, med 3 is the standard sick note, which you can give to someone who's been off work at least for seven days. It's not valid in the first seven days of an illness. After that, you could sign them off on a med 3. That's the normal sick note, okay? Statement of uh, fitness uh, to work, okay? Med 3, it says in the, in the corner. There's no fee payable. That's what we call a contractual or statutory form. ESA 113, sometimes called UC ESA 113, UC standing for universal credit, is a report that's sometimes requested by the Department of Works and Pensions doctor. So if someone's been on sick pay for 28 weeks, after that, it triggers, you can't be on statutory sick pay beyond that. It triggers an independent assessment by a doctor appointed by the Department of Works and Pensions. That's what DWP stands for. Um, and they're assessing if they're too sick to you know, do any work or whether they need to start back at work. And if they assess that they're too sick to do any work, they stop being on sick pay and they go into employment and support allowance, a different benefit, okay? As part of filling that, making that decision, they might contact the GP who's got the full records and say, look, we need you to fill in the ESA 113 with more information from the records. There's no fee payable. That's a statutory or contractual form. And finally, the other one that was mentioned was the DS-1500. This is the Special Rules Medical Certificate. This is only applicable for patients who've got a terminal illness who might need support with mobility or care, usually to apply for benefits that you know, where you need help with things like that, things like a, a personal independence payment. You need to have been sick for several months and 
we need to think that you're going to need it for at least six to nine months going forward, depending if it's PIP or um, if, if it's um, disability living allowance, okay, for people under 16. But the DS1500, if someone's got a terminal illness and you think they've probably got less than six months life expectancy, you fill that form in, they'll start getting their first benefits within about a week. It's a fast track system because these patients need support now. It's no good waiting three, four months because they might only have three, four months to live. Now, there is actually a fee payable for this, but we don't charge the payment to the uh, patient, unlike the D4, the patient pays for that. You fill in the DS1500, you send it off, the patient gets their benefits, the government will pay the practice. Okay. So if we go back to the question, the one that was most popular after D4 was the D2. The D2 is the application form completed by the driver. We don't have anything to do with that as doctors. And you see the question, this is part of exam technique, that you might have heard of D2, but if you don't read what the question is asking, it says they need to have a medical report, which of the following is the most relevant form to complete for this patient, I, for us to do a medical report. That's the D4. The D2 is the application form that the patient sends with the D4, but we don't have anything to do with the D2. Okay, so easy to miss that, right? Someone asked, can an ST3 do a D4? Any qualified doctor can do a, a, a D4. You don't have to be a GP. Um, you know, even someone who's got full registration who's at F2 level could do a D4. I wouldn't recommend it, but they could, okay? Okay, and let's do a stats one. And I'll stop that there. Okay, so that's really interesting. So this is the new style data interpretation question that started coming out end of last year. And there's been more of this type of question. And a lot of doctors, just if you're not familiar with this type of data, this is real data I pulled today from Public Health England website. Okay, these are real practices and this is real data on their actual patients. Okay, and that's one of the things that they've got a bigger emphasis on is getting people to get familiar and testing if they can interpret real data. It's actually relevant to when you're a GP. So for example, this is one of the markers of quality. You know, how many antibiotics are we prescribing generally? Um, antibiotics per star PU, I'll explain what that is in a minute. And then how many of those are broad spectrum antibiotics? Okay, um, and so these are quality indicators that you can use to compare your prescribing to, in this case, NHS Birmingham Solihull is like the CCG for the area where I practice and then the England average. Okay, so that, this is England. This is, you know, your commissioning group or your health board or your local health board, your area. And each of these is a specific practice code. These are specific practices. So the most popular answer, just over half of you picked Church Lane. And then after that, Church Road. And then after that, City Health. But every option was picked, okay? Including one person picked F, all right? Which isn't even on there. So the correct answer is B, Church Lane. Okay, so about half of you have got this right, well done. So a couple of things I wanna show you, why people might get this wrong. Again, this goes to technique. You don't need to do any calculation here, even if you've never seen this type of question before. If you read the question carefully, again, exam technique, you could probably answer this. But you know, if you're familiar with this type of data and you spend some time looking at this type of data, then it makes it really easy to answer this type of question. You don't need a calculator, you don't need to do any formulae, nothing, okay? So the first thing is to read carefully. It says, which practice has the highest total number of prescribed antibiotic items per star PU in Q2 2020? So you might have a question where they had data from different quarters, but all of this data is Q2 2020. Okay, so that means quarter two. So then we just need to make sure we're looking at the right line, which is this line, prescribed antibiotic items per star PU. So why might some people have got it wrong? For example, some people picked Church Road. You might have got that wrong just because you actually got this right but then when you were looking up here, you just saw church and then you didn't see that this one, one's church lane and one's church road. And you might have just, um, you might have just looked at the wrong thing. Do you see? So pick the wrong option, just saw the church and didn't pay attention to the second part. That can happen. 
So if we look at the numbers, okay, you can see that Church Lane has 0.31 items per star PU, and that's higher than any of the others. The next highest is 0.26, which is Church Road, okay? Do you see? Now, why might some people have picked Cofton Medical Center? Because some people picked E. You might have picked that because you looked at the wrong line. If you look at Broad Spectrum, they've got 10.19 per thousand, which is higher than anyone else. So you might have picked it because of that, okay? So, you know, mistakes can be made either in reading here, reading the wrong line, or misreading what they're asking you to actually look for over here, okay? But this type of question is more common, um, and it's not just this, you know, different kinds of metrics that we often use as quality indicators. So antibiotic items prescribed per thousand patients, antibiotic items prescribed per star piece. What's that? That is specific therapeutic group age sex weightings related prescribing units. I, there might be some practices where they might be prescribing a lot less than other people, but let's say they've got really young cohort of patients. They're less likely to have, you know, um, illnesses, they're less likely, for example, uh, to, to get things that, you know, pick up lower respiratory tract infections, for example, uh, less likely to um, need antibiotics than someone who, for example, is older um, or has got multiple morbidity, um, things like that. If you look at, for example, a practice that's got a much higher proportion of males than females, um, women are much more likely to get UTIs, which is a common thing that we do prescribe antibiotics appropriately for. And it might be entirely appropriate to be prescribing in that particular practice with lots of women. And so what the star PU does is it adjusts for um, age, sex, and it waits for that and for, you know, specific therapeutic groups within that. So it's a nice way to take account of demographics. And then another indicator is, you know, how many broad spectrum antibiotics as a, a proportion are you prescribing? Other things, benzodiazepines, you know, how many prescriptions are you writing for things like uh, diazepam? Um, temazepam, things like that, and then the Z drug prescribing. So, you know, sleeping tablets like Zolpidem, Zopiclone, uh, things like that, okay? And you can spend some time getting familiar with this type of data at this website, fingertips.phe.org.uk. You can just play around and find that data, okay? Okay, so just want to get an idea in terms of when people are thinking of sitting the AKT, um, if you can just let me know if I just open the poll. So select A if you're actually already sat it and you're waiting for the result from October. I know there are a lot of people hitting refresh every few seconds until their fingers hurt until six o'clock because they were hoping it would come out because often the results do come out the night before, but they didn't come out today. So you'll you know, be waiting for tomorrow, I'm sure. Um, hopefully you get some sleep tonight. Uh, B, if you're sitting in January, the booking's open for that this morning. I understand there were a lot of problems doctors had with bookings. Not all the slots were showing at the beginning and eventually, you know, so hopefully you can get a slot near you. C for April next year, D for October, E 2022 or later. And then F, you've already passed and you just love learning or you, you know, like to join this session for your CPD. Okay, so great. So I can see off today, uh, the bulk of people are sitting in January, um, about 40 odd percent of you. Um, and then after that, it's a split between people coming, they're sitting either April, October next year, or they're waiting for results. Uh, they were all about even. And then some people are in ST1 now. Uh, so, you know, come really early. That's fantastic. You're just joining these things for learning. That's great. And then we've got a handful of people who've already passed and just like learning, which I, I love to see. Okay. Uh, you know, GP is about lifelong learning. Okay. Good. So, in terms of free support that we offer for those of you that are preparing for AKT, if you're not already a member of the GP training support group, someone will post the link to that into the chat in a minute. Okay, please do join. Okay, let me see, is the chat open? Yeah, the chat is open. Um, the last 30 days before every exam, I post a video every day with the high yield question and some rapid revision. Um, if you missed the previous national VTS training, uh, or the lockdown learning sessions I did in the first lockdown. The recordings of all of those are on our YouTube channel. So there's over 15 hours worth of uh, recordings now because we did nine lockdown learning sessions. There's five of these, there's various other bits on there, okay? Um, and then I just finished writing and um, they're just now doing the design work on uh, an AKT study guide that we're going to publish with the Medical Protection Society. So their designers are busy getting it into a, a nice format. I finished writing that. A uh, couple of weeks ago. So that will be coming out. And um, at the next monthly VTS, I will pop, pop a link or before that, if it's published, I'll pop a link into the group where you can get that for free. 
Okay, so that covers how to prepare for the exam, some free questions. Okay, and in terms of our other resources, so um, those of you that are planning to sit uh, anytime next year, you if you want to kickstart your learning, we're running an AKT masterclass half day as a national revision course with the Royal College. Okay, um, so if you wanted to attend that, if you were to type in um, RCGP uh, AKT course, and then you'd see on the RCGP learning site, you see here, this is the one, AKT Preparation Masterclass, high yield, okay? So that's this Saturday, 1.30 till six o'clock, four and a half hours, including, the, there'll be a little break, but over four hours of CPD. We'll look at how to prepare for the exam. We'll do a teaching mini mod. We'll go through 50 different topics, some stats, some admin, some clinical. So you just register. And because it's through the RCGP's website, um, in most cases, do check with your deanery, but in most cases, you should be able to claim that back through your study budget, okay? A lot of people, because a lot of courses have been canceled, they actually have got study budget and they don't know what to do with it. So, you know, that's a good chance. It's 125 pounds um, and we'll be running that with RCGP beds and hearts, but you'll get a certificate of attendance from the RCGP, okay? So that's this weekend on Saturday. Um, and then our main AKT preparation course uh, for the January exam is going to be on December the 12th. Um, so that's over seven hours. Um, we go through how to prepare, big focus on exam technique. We cover key stats. We cover a lot of key admin topics. We we'll look at a lot of high yield clinical topics. And then there'll be two teaching mocks of 35 questions each. And then a picture mock where we'll just look at picture and video questions. Um, we've got our AKT masterclass webinars coming up in January. They're three and a half hours each. One covers all the key stats topics in one evening. One's all of the admin topics. One's all the high yield clinical topics from the last 10 years worth of examiner's reports. Then with the Royal College, we're running the AKT 200 question crammer. So again, if you go back to the AKT website, uh, the RCGP website, if you just scroll down further, that's gonna be the beginning of January. So uh, probably, there we are. That's that one there, 2nd of January. Um, and again, you can book on there. At the moment, that's on early bird, so it's £195. Um, it will move to a standard ticket price about a week or two before, which is £235. So you can get a discount if you book that now. Um, and then we've got our AKT Pass Plus bundle, which brings all of these things together, plus our online revision, plus a set of our clinical case cards. Okay, so there's 110 hours worth of learning in total there. Um, or our most comprehensive program, our AKT Pass Guarantee program. So uh, the next pass guarantee program to show you if you want to look at more details of any of these go to our homepage, and then in the akt section whatever you want to find out more details about like our main course and you can see what it covers uh, that's available as a bundle with the online revision and you, you can find all the details there but the pass guarantee program is our most comprehensive program so we've got a 150 day program for the april exam that's starting um, at the end of this month i think on the 29th and then we've got a 90 day program for the april exam that will start 90 days before uh, the april exam so you can either book that with two installments or in one go but it covers nine high yield webinars, regular emails where you'll be given a question of the day, some reading to do, some online revision, over 3000 questions, two full day courses, nine webinars, the case cards, um, over 220 hours of learning. As long as you do all the work on time, attend everything, we guarantee you'll pass. If you don't, even if you fail by one mark, you can either attend the whole program again, or you can have every penny back, okay? You won't need it though, because if you complete the program, you'll pass, okay? So that's all of the different things that we do for AKT. and. As I mentioned, um, we've got AKT online revision, over 2,100 questions, including a full mock, mapped to the RCGP curriculum. Um, and then you've seen our case cards. Um, these are bang up to date, published uh, September, 2020. So 112 topic reviews, 56 double-sided cards. They include, for example, the 2020 Impetigo guidelines, the latest NICE hypertension guidelines. Uh, the kind of thing that, you know, keep it with you, do one in the morning, do one in between when a patient doesn't show up, just do a couple of cards a day between now and the January exam without realizing you've covered 112 topics. So just to, before we move on to the next session, you can save 10% on any of our AKT or RCA courses, webinars, online revision, case cards, or the bundles. The only thing that this code won't work on is our pass guarantee program. That's already heavily discounted by over 400 pounds. So we don't have any discount codes that will give discount like this, okay? So the code is VTS5, because this is the fifth national VTS, all lowercase, just pop that in and it will give you 10% discount. So it will work on other discounted bundles, although it won't work on the pass guarantee. For example, the AKT Pass Plus, which is already discounted, okay? 
if you were to use that code, BTS5, and then press enter, it'll take 10% off, okay? Or on the online revision or on the case cuts, okay? So that will expire midnight tomorrow. So we're gonna move on to consultation skills now. So I wanna cover each month one key consultation skill, but then build it into a case so you can see how you'd actually apply it. So I think one of the big things that I've seen, and this is for everyday consulting, for you know when you're seeing patients in clinic, for when you're qualified GP, but also for those of you doing the RCA, I've seen this can make a huge difference to managing in the time that you've got. And that is to know what you want to ask and to ask what you want to know. That if you know what you want to ask, I, you know your guidelines, knowledge gives you power. You know exactly what, if you're running short of time, for example, I absolutely can't miss this this, this red flag because they could change the management, they could change the diagnosis. So I've got to ask these. Whereas if I've got lots of time, I might ask this and this, but if I don't, they're optional, okay? And then to be direct and concise and ask what you want to know when you're in the main data garden. So when you start the consultation, it's nice to build a bit of rapport, open with a couple of open questions. You know, how can I help today? Tell me a bit more. But when you're in the bulk of your main data gathering, if you keep asking open questions, instead of asking focused, concise questions of what you actually want to know, you often will lose a lot of time and won't find out useful information. So let me give you an example. So we've got a 15 year old patient. She's come in requesting emergency contraception. OK, so I'm going to show you the power of knowing what you want to ask and then asking what you want to know. So just let me see if the chat's open. If not, I'll open it. Yeah. So just type into the chat. What are some of the key things that you want to ask initially? So the, the patient has said, doctor, um, I need to get the emergency pill. OK, so what are some of the first things that you want to find out a little bit more detail about? Just type that into the chat. Let's see what people uh, think is important. OK. Okay, so first thing, really, really important, when was the episode of unprotected sexual intercourse? That's really important, right? Because depending when it was, was it two days, three days, four days, five days, which options you might be able to give would be important. Okay, um, so then we want to find out other things like, could they already be pregnant? So when was the last period? That's really important. Absolutely, right? Okay, so we want to rule out pregnancy. We want to look at what are they... You know, for example, someone might ask for emergency contraception, but they actually got some form of long term contraception, but they've missed a few pills. So that would be also important to know. Right. Um, have they had any uh, symptoms of STI? Have they had any STIs in the past? OK. What about even before that? Look at this. 15. Great. So a couple of people have said want to start assessing. Are they mature enough to understand for their capacity? Are they Gillick competent? Do they understand? Can they make their own decisions? That's really important, okay? And then a bit later on, we want to find out a bit more about the partner. Could there be a safeguarding issue? I want you to just hold on to that for a second. We're going to come back and get more detail on specific questions about the partner in a minute, okay? So, great. People have asked a lot of really good questions. So, yeah, absolutely right. So, in terms of data gathering, if we look at it in sequence, early on, you want to ask, what do you know about emergency contraception? What do you know about the emergency pill? I, that's a good way to work out, are they mature? All right. That's how I might assess, are they, like, if they say, well, look, because I've had sex and, you know, I hadn't used a condom, there's a chance I could get pregnant. I understand that there is a pill that I could take that might prevent me getting pregnant. And that, that's what I want. You know, someone that clearly understand what it is that the medicine that they want is for, and they understand why they're at risk of getting pregnant. That's a good way to assess that. And then a lot of people confuse Gillick competence with the Fraser guidelines. They're not the same thing. So I often hear people talking about, are they Fraser competent? There's no such thing as Fraser competence. There's Gillick competence, which is, is this patient who's under 16 mature? Can they understand, weigh up decisions and make their own decisions? That applies to anyone under 16 making any decision. Then there's the Fraser guidelines, which only applies on top of, is someone's Gillick competent? If the decision is about sexual health, or contraception, which would fit here, okay? So one of the things is knowing, okay, we'll come back to that in a second, is knowing that, for example, a specific part of the phrase of guidelines is trying to persuade them to tell a parent. You know, I think it'd be a really good idea that you tell your mum or your dad that you're gonna be starting medication because if you have a side effect or if you have a reaction to it, you know, they'll know that they need to get you help. 
Do you think that you'd be willing to tell your mum or your dad when you get home? Do you see, it's important that you actively, especially for those doing the RCA, if you were to submit a case like this, you need to show the examiner that you've thought about the Fraser guidelines by specifically asking or encouraging them to tell a parent, right? Okay. Okay, then we've got the sexual history, right? So, you know, the current episode, when did they have the unprotected intercourse? Where they, they might have used some contraceptive, they might have used condoms and it split, for example, okay? You want to get more detail about that, okay? Um, past history, has, they, has this happened before? Were they taking any long-term contraception? Uh, past sexual history in terms of STIs and things like that. Menstrual history, what's their cycle normally like? When was their last period? Could they already be pregnant, right? And then we've got child protection, right? So, you know, several people have said, how old is the partner? What do they do? Their position, um, the interaction that they've had so far, uh, the, the red flag. So now I'm going to show you, I'll do a little bit of role play. Uh, okay. So what do we want to know about the partner? And how might we ask it? So let me show you an example of something that sometimes people like, people have already said a lot of good things as to what they want to know. So they want to know, was there any coercion? Okay. Uh, how old are they? Um, what do they do? What else would you like to know about the partner? Specifics. Okay. Okay. How long they've had this been in a relationship? Whether that relationship, you know, they feel pressure to do anything they don't want to do. I, could there be um, a, any kind of risk that, you know, um, they're being forced, for example. Okay. Or they're being groomed. Okay. What else? So the interaction. So things like, if you've got someone who's buying this young girl lots of drinks, they might say yes to sex, but they might say it when they really are so drunk that they don't really have capacity at the time. OK, um, how did they meet? Um, have they been offering to buy them lots of expensive gifts that a young girl might not be able to uh, afford? Have they got a position of authority? OK, things like that. OK, great. Now, these are really good questions that you guys are asking. That's great to see. But let me show you how what often happens when we do this as a role play at a course or, you know, sometimes in real life is that. These are the questions you want to know, right? So you know what you want to ask, but people don't ask what they want to know. This is what they ask. As I mentioned, at the beginning, it's great to ask some open questions. You know, how can I help you? Tell me a bit more. But now you know they specifically want the pill. Don't be scared to be a, a clinician and ask some specific questions, okay? So what you don't want to do is ask a vague open question like this. So um, it'd be helpful if I would find out a bit more about this guy that you, you know, recently met that you said that you had uh, unprotected sex with. Could you tell me a bit more about him? Now, look, this is a 15 year old girl. She may well be infatuated. If it's someone older, they're often, you know, um, really, really in their mind, they're in love. Um, what do you think is important to a 15 year old girl? What do you think is going through their mind? And what are they going to tell you? If you say something like, tell me a bit more about them. This is what's going to happen. Okay. Excuse me. I know you have to use your imagination. I'm going to pretend to be a 15 year old girl. Now. So this is what she might say to you. <laughs> um, he's really handsome. Uh, he's got the, the most beautiful blue eyes I've ever seen. And, you know, I really like that, you know, we could just have a proper conversation because, you know, like the boys at school, they're like, you know, they're so immature. They're always like pushing people and they use bad. Luck. This guy, you know, because he's been working for a long time, he's, he's really I really like that. He he knows how to look after me. He's really kind. And, uh, you know, he, he clearly goes to the gym. You know, he's really buff and he's well fit. He is. And do I care about any of this stuff? No. Is this what you wanted to know? No. But you see, if you ask a vague question, you're often going to give a vague answer. Whereas if you want to find out those things, you could ask some specifics. It'd be really helpful to find out a bit more about this guy you've just met. Can I ask you, how old is he? And what does he do? How did you meet? Okay. And did he offer to buy you any drinks? Did he offer to give you any drugs or anything like that? Um, and since you've met, have you been in touch? You know, has he been, um, have you been in contact on social media? Has he asked you to send any pictures or anything like that? Now, look, sometimes someone older can try to take advantage of someone younger. Has he ever asked you to do anything that you don't feel comfortable with? Do you feel pressured in any way? You know, did you feel pressure to start a physical? Do you see the difference that if you know what you want to ask and you ask what you want to know, you can get the specific information to work out if there is a risk or there isn't a risk. Whereas if you ask a vague question like that in the middle, you see, it's not that open questions are bad or that closed questions are bad. They're not good or bad. They're different tools. You've got to use the right tool at the right time. You've got to use the right skill at the right time, right? Do you see? So that's why you need to ask specifics so that you can systematically but quickly and concisely rule out the red flags. That's going to help you work out the next steps, okay? So now let's say 
you've asked me these questions and I tell you that this guy is a teaching assistant at my school who recently started. He's an, on exchange. He's in his early 20s. Um, he has not offered to buy me any presents, but he did offer me cannabis. OK, so you found out some of those details and I was happy to have sex. I wasn't pressured, but you found out those things. He's got a position of authority. He's older. He offered some drugs. Do you see how that might now help you make your next step in terms of decision? Is there a safeguarding issue? So and then you need to know. What are the rules in terms of when you need to inform safeguarding and when you don't? So these are the rules. If your patient is 13, 14 or 15 and they consent to sex, you shouldn't usually report that unless there's some red flags. If they're under 13, you should usually report that because even if they say yes, that consent isn't valid. OK, so you'd report that to safeguarding. So these are the six examples of red flags. Like if any of these were there and you feel that this patient is at risk, you should tell safeguarding. So they're too immature to understand or consent. So they might say yes, but they might be physically 15, but maybe they've got a significant learning difficulty. They don't really understand what they're agreeing to and someone's taking advantage of that. There's a big difference in age, maturity or power. Now, there's no set number. It's for you to use your judgment, OK, between the sexual partners. The partner's got a position of trust, like a teacher, like, a, um, uh, you know, someone with a position of authority or trust. If there's any force or threat of force or psychological pressure or bribery or payment, drugs or alcohol are used. So, for example, this patient had been offered cannabis, OK, or they're already known to be a sex offender, the partner. You see, if any of these were there, you tell safeguarding. OK, so do you see why it's important that if you don't ask these things, you could miss it. You could miss where there is a significant safeguarding issue. So you need to know what you need to ask. That's why knowledge just gives you power. But they need to ask what you need to, you need to ask about these things to rule them out. OK, and then you'll allow you to move on because then you need to start thinking about, OK, once we've worked out what we're going to give for the emergency contraception, if they have are sexually active and they're in this situation now, if we don't think about long term contraception, they might end up in it again. So that's when you need to also think about safety to start long term contraception. So things like smoking, history of clots, strokes, breast disease, family history of that, migraines. And then in terms of examination, you need to do their blood pressure and their body mass index, right? Because it might tell you whether the mini pill or the combined pill would be fine. So let's say now there are no contraindications. Body mass index is in the 20s. Blood pressure is fine. Uh, smokes you know, one or two spliffs cannabis once in a while when she can get hold of it, but doesn't otherwise smoke. And there's no family history of any of these, no migraine. OK, so in terms of and the unprotected intercourse was two days ago. OK, how would you manage this patient? Would you first question, would you give her emergency contraception? Last period. Was. 11 days ago, normally has a, a 28 or 29 day cycle. Um, two days since the unprotected intercourse. So would you give her emergency contraception? Would you start her on long term contraception? Combined pill or mini pill? OK. Great. Would you tell safeguarding? Yeah, so you see, there are two different decisions. Some doctors find it really difficult that when there's clearly a safeguarding issue, they think that they shouldn't give contraception you would just be making things worse, wouldn't you? Now you've got someone who's potentially being abused by this teaching assistant and they might end up with an unplanned pregnancy. So one is a clinical decision. Is it safe to give them emergency contraception? And is it safe to give them long-term contraception? If it is, sort that out. The other is, is there a safeguarding issue? In this case, there is, in which case you tell safeguarding, okay? And you would normally let them know you're gonna do so in their best interest, okay? So in terms of management, you'd give them emergency contraception. And because it was two days ago, all the options are suitable. You could give them leave and adjust or you could give them allopostal acetate. You could give them the coil if they're happy to have that. If they want something oral, then you'd also think about the quick start protocol, you know, starting long term contraception uh, with leave and adjust. You could start it the same day with allopostal acetate. They need to wait five days before they start something like microgyno. And then it needs to be reported to safeguarding because there were two red flags. Position of authority, teaching assistant. So there's that big difference of of power there. But then on top of that, there was the other one that then offered them drugs. OK. Good. OK, so how to learn what you need to ask quickly and efficiently? Well, one of the ways is our CSA 100 case crammer. Now, this is useful whether you're preparing for the RCA or some of you are eventually going to prepare for the CSA. Or if you've never done a GP rotation and you're coming up to your first GP rotation, this is really going to help you. OK, so um, we cover 100 cases 
And for each one, I talk through, like I've done with you now, what are the key things in history? What are the relevant red flags? Um, what are the examinations? And I show you how to do them because it's on video. Um, what are the current guidelines for management? How would you explain it in clear, concise language? Um, so there's a hundred and of those hundred, 20 of them are interactive cases. So you find this here, the CSA, RCA section on our website, 100 case grammar, okay? And it just shows you these are some of the cases covered. So for each one, and there's a 350 page PDF booklet that comes with it that you can download and you've got those slides to, to learn. And you know, if you know exactly what are the questions to ask, what are the things that you mustn't miss, it makes it much easier for you when you're actually consulting. We do have a printed version. Uh, so if you book the online, you don't get the printed version. Some people just like to buy this on its own. Some people like to buy it as well. You get the PDF, which you can print yourself, but it's 350 pages. It's a huge booklet, okay? And so you can see like, you know, here we go, mild, moderate depression. We've got the key things to ask in history, rapid screen for low mood, what are the red flags, social history, current guidelines for management, interpersonal, how you might deal with that. You know, so there's a hundred different cases there and 20 of them, there's actors and you'll see that people are thinking about the questions to ask. You can sort of, you know, start really thinking about how to take those histories and you will see the role player will sort of answer the questions um, that I'm asking them on, on the audience's behalf. And then for those of you preparing for RCA, we've got our RCA masterclass webinar. Uh, this is bang up to date. We updated it after the changes in November. So including the new sanctions for um, missing mandatory cases, the new way of marking, what are the new mandatory cases, the differences between CSA and RCA, why people fail and how to avoid it. And then there's six interactive cases, okay? And then our full day RCA preparation course includes access to this and more videos for pre-course. On the day, we do 25 cases with simulators, you'll get detailed individual feedback on your consultation and communication skills, and you get 65 cases to practice afterwards with detailed mark schemes and some more videos to watch, okay? The next available date is 19th of January. We're fully booked for December and for the early January dates. Again, I'll just show you on our website. That's the top one on the RCA. So you can see we were full in November, we're full in December, we're full for the beginning of January. I've just opened this evening bookings for the 19th of January and then the 2nd of February, okay? Um, if you are planning to submit your RCA in January, then what you'll find helpful is definitely to do this, but maybe to do this as well so you can learn the theory, so, you know, in terms of recording, but this will cover how to get good quality recordings. If you want individual practice and feedback, then coming to this is ideal to come at least a couple of months before you've got time to make changes afterwards, okay? Um, so this was the last one we ran last week. So we tend to have uh, nine uh, registrars. Uh, there'll be a male simulator, a female simulator. So this is Gillian, our female simulator. Uh, Alistair, our male simulator. And then there'll be myself and another assessor to give feedback. So you get feedback from you know different people. Right, last session today, we've got about 10 minutes to cover e-portfolio, how to write a concise clinical case review and how to make it a useful learning tool for you, okay? So remember that in the new workplace-based assessment, that clinical case reviews are the most common type of learning log. You need to do 36 of these a year as a minimum in each year of training, ST1, ST2, and ST3, okay? And so for each one of these, you put in the, the brief details, the title, the date, the setting, start with a very brief description of the case, link it to a clinical experience group, maximum two, minimum one, and then link it to at least one capability and a maximum of three capabilities. I'll show you what those are in a minute. And then it asks you to do three things. Describe what actually happened and how you sort of uh, link it to the capability. Then some reflection. What will you maintain, improve or stop? And then what you're gonna do going forward? What learning needs have you identified? Now, a lot of people struggle with these or you know they see it as a chore, as, as boxes they have to tick. And that can mean that you actually miss out the learning opportunity that these give you, okay? So this is what it looks like on 14 fish. So the title here can literally be a few words. I'll show you a worked example in a minute, okay? And then you put the date and the setting, you know, was it GP, was it a telephone triage, was it a video consultation, a visit, out of hours, you know, something else, okay? Then you've got a brief description. When you start typing, this will open up, okay? Then you've got the clinical experience group that you're linking this to, and then capability, at least one, maximum three. And then the bulk of the writing, the reflection, and the learning needs here, okay? So let me show you how to make it a bit, easier instead of thinking about their questions which aren't 
clear exactly what to put. You can link it just to think about these three simple questions. What did you do? That's the brief description and the link to the capabilities. OK, what did you learn? That links to what will you maintain, improve or stop as a result of this? And then what will you do next? And that's the learning needs that you've identified for ongoing uh, learning. OK, so these are the nine clinical experience groups and anything that doesn't fit clearly, it goes into group nine. Group nine is clinical problems not linked to a specific clinical experience group. So, you know, there might be something that's clearly a child fits to group, group one. There might be something that, you know, it's like the one we've just done would clearly fit with number two. It's sexual health. OK, so it fits with gender, reproductive, sexual health. You know, there might be, let's say you've got doing a diabetic uh, review, someone you're going to add in more medication that would fit with people with long term conditions, for example. Um, you know, you've got someone terminal home visit older adults, including frailty or people. That, and you see, some are really easy, but you might have something that doesn't quite fit. Anything that doesn't quite fit, put it into number nine. OK. And then you've got capabilities. So you've got these seven. Uh, the most common ones that are going to be really easy to link to a lot of uh, clinical case reviews are communication and consultation skills, data gathering and interpretation, some SEPs, and then six and seven, making a diagnosis uh, or decision and clinical management. These are really easy to link. If you've got a patient with multiple morbidity, you know, complexity, then you might get an eight. And then some of the others, they're not always going to be to an individual case review. They're going to be sometimes, though, for example, you might have something that was beyond what you could manage on your own. And you had to, you know, phone the hospital registrar and discuss with them. So now that might link in with working with colleagues in teams and, and so on. OK, so just I'd like you all to think about the last day that you were at work seeing patients. For some of you, that would have been today. Some of you might have been on a day off today because you've had nights or whatever. But trying to think about the last day that you were at work, OK? And I want you to think about one specific patient that you saw, all right? And I'm going to show you how easy it is that if you just think about these three questions, what did you do? So that's what actually happened. What did you learn? And what will you do next? That Actually, you can write a clinical case review in less than 10 minutes, usually in about five, six minutes once you get practiced, okay? But when you start, less than 10 minutes. So I know some people, they really struggle because they're trying to find half an hour, 45 minutes they're spending on this. Remember that as much as you hate writing these, your trainer hates reading them. As long as you can make it concise and map to the right things, and you know, you've got a decent number, they're gonna be happy that they can sign you off. You know, they don't wanna spend hours reading these either, all right? So just have a think about that for a specific patient that you've seen you know, the last day you were at work and just thinking about those questions, it work as a prompt. I'll show you an actual work example, but I want you to think about it yourself. So here's an example. This is actually one I actually saw in clinic recently. OK, so the title doesn't have to be long. Recurrent UTI, the brief description. So the, the prompt for you to think about what did I do? So look, I saw a patient who was under section. I, one of my roles as a portfolio GP, I work in a secure unit for women who are sectioned. They've got significant mental health illness. So they're vulnerable. They've got a psych team that look after their mental health, but myself and my partner at my practice, we look after all of their GP primary care needs. So she was, you know, under section and she presented with recurrent UTI. She'd been in for several months. OK, um, so you can imagine how unwell someone is to be sectioned for several months. She hadn't responded to antibiotic treatment. She had like three different causes. Um, after examination, doing a urine dipstick, I reviewed the NICE guidelines on which patients to send MSUs, you know, when someone's having recurrent UTIs, for example. Um, and the recommendations for treatment and prophylaxis in that context. So the clinical experience group here was people with health disadvantage or vulnerability. The fact that they were sectioned and had various other illnesses. OK, uh, and the capabilities this linked well to three of them. Data gathering, communication and consultation skills and clinical management. And you can talk about how you linked into that. So data gathering, for example, you know, I had to find out about previous episodes. I had to also rule out, could it be STI? I had to look at other red flags that might, you know, change whether you send a sample or not or whether they need to go in because someone's not responding if they had you know fever at the moment they might be septic it could actually be someone that needs to be admitted okay um, i had to examine them you know examine the abdomen communication and consultation skills someone who's already sectioned you know this patient was really upset about that and their mental health was at a point that they needed to be sectioned but then because they weren't responding they were having symptoms they were just really fed up so you can imagine how much worse that would be for someone who's already got significant mental health illness okay but then also in some cases because of that vulnerability they might not want to be examined and so you have to really communicate very very 
you know, be sensitive, show lots of empathy, you know, with the chaperone for me to be able to do like an abdominal examination and get them to agree. And in terms of management, you know, I want to think about uh, mapping and linking into um, the current guidelines. You know, there's lots of things where guidelines change. So although I might have been fairly up to date, I want to make sure nothing's changed because sometimes guidelines change and, you know, you haven't read it for a couple of months. So I need to make sure, you know, what should I do in this context? Okay. Um, so that's the first part, right? Then what will you maintain, improve or stop? That's how it looks on the actual 14 fish. But my question for you to think about this is what did you learn? So you know what, after reading that, I'll actually realize that I don't need to send, uh, I was sending maybe more samples off than I need to, because there's lots of patients where as long as you're confident in interpreting the dipstick, and if they haven't got, like this patient with recurrent not responding, they did need to have one sent. But there are some patients where if, you know, leukocytes and nitrites are positive, they've got typical symptoms, they haven't got recurrence, there's no need to send it, just treat them empirically. And so you can better manage patients. But also in terms of recurrent UTI, it's important that you do make sure that you're getting a good sample. It's better to get a first catch in the morning, you know, because you want to be absolutely sure that this is what you're getting back in the result is accurate. And then learning is identified. And you know, what will you do next? I wanted to just find out actually what are the local prescribing policies because there's national guidance, but often there's local resistance patterns that might mean, that might explain why she's not responding to the normal first line and the referral pathways for resistant cases so that I could make sure that you know she's fully treated. You see, if you think about those three questions, you can make it a lot easier for you to actually write based on just thinking about what happened, okay? So to summarize, you're gonna do 36 per year as a minimum. Try to keep it concise because your trainer doesn't want to spend ages reading them. You don't want to spend ages writing them. But almost anything you see can become a case review if you use it as a learning opportunity. If you don't just see it as a training thing, you know what? Okay, if I read up these guidelines, it's going to help me prepare for my exams, but it's also going to help me consult better because the next time I see a patient with this, I'm going to know this. I'm going to be more confident. I'm going to know these are the red flags and therefore I need to ask, you know, these are the indications to send a sample. So let me ask these questions to make sure none of them are there. It's going to make it much, much easier, okay? And for those of you that are starting training in February, um, you know, that are about to start training, or those of you that are in ST1, if you're still finding it difficult to get to grips with the ePortfolio, then our GP ST Plus maximize your GP training course it's for people who are about to start and those in ST1. So we cover the ePortfolio in huge amount of detail, uh, the new ePortfolio, the 14 fish portfolio, including all of the new requirements for workplace based assessment. We cover um, course and qualifications that you might do during training to help you afterwards, like these ones, you know, which ones are manageable, how to do them, what are the current costs and things like that. We cover all of the requirements for workplace-based assessment, the different types of learning logs, the 10 different types, uh, the ARCP outcomes and what they mean. Uh, we cover, you know, paperwork, paying contracts, expenses you can claim, medical legal issues, how to reduce your chance of getting complaints, what to do if you get one, um, how writing good notes can save you. We cover AKT and CSA, uh, and then also, if you want to develop a portfolio career, start developing a special interest after training. You don't do that when you're in training. But what can you do during training to get a head start and the secrets to succeeding in training? So again, that's the uh, details of that. Someone will post a link. Uh, do join the GP training support group. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to get the videos. Tell us what you thought. I will send a request for feedback tomorrow. Uh, and if you're not a member, there's 21,600 plus doctors. We've got trainees in every deanery and trainers and examiners in the group as well. Uh, and our YouTube channel's there. There's loads of free CPD and, and learning on there, okay? So for those leaving, thank you very much. Keep pushing, keep going, prepare, and you will succeed. I really appreciate you giving up part of your evening to join me.